Good morning, everyone, and happy June. Can't believe we're already in June. Um, time is just flying by, but we have a very exciting interview this morning, and I just want to give a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, first, a reminder that our June monthly coalition meeting is scheduled for Friday, June 17th at 11 a.m., um, so please be mindful of that time change again. Um, it's from 11 to 1. Um, second, please make sure um, to write your name and organization in the comment box and post any questions that you have along the way with the interview, and we'll make sure to address them at the end of the session. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Heather to um, go ahead and begin our interview this morning. Okay, great. Thank you. I know people are still coming in, but I'm super excited. We want to jump into our conversation with Chris Cowperthwaite. Um, so excited to have you here. And we know you're the Director of Communications and Outreach for the North Carolina Nurses Association. And I, I know we've just entered June, but we're coming out of May, which is National Nurses Month. So it seems so appropriate and fitting to have you here now to bring us, uh, bring us up to date. Before we all, we want to learn so much about you, but before we dive into your story, if you could just take a little quick moment to tell us about the North Carolina Nurses Association, and then we'll circle back to that later, but then we'll get into you. <laughs> all right. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm usually on the other side of these types of interviews, <laughs> so this is going to be fun uh, and a little bit different from my perspective. Um, the North Carolina Carolina Nurses Association uh, has been around for a while. We were formed in 1902. Uh, the entire purpose of NCNA was to help get nurses registered. It was not a thing back at the turn of the century uh, around the 1800s and 1900s. And North Carolina became the first state in the entire country to pass a registered nurse law. Uh, and that, that was the entire purpose of NCNA being formed. Uh, they managed to get that law passed about a year after their formation uh, through no small amount of work uh, from our founder, Mary Louis, Louis Weish, who is sort of a, a nursing legend in the state. Um, and, you know, from there, we've just sort of been on the forefront of trying to, to move the profession forward. Uh, we advocate really hard for patient care, obviously, and for the nursing profession. Yeah. Great. Well, we are going to come come back in just a little bit about diving into what's going on with the North Carolina Nurses Association and, and your job there as communications and outreach. But bring us back a little bit to to younger Chris. Where where are you from? What's your background? How did you get into this work? I, OK, um, so I've bounced around a lot. I was born in Florida, grew up in New York City and then went to high school in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, my father is an Episcopal priest, so he ended up getting a job uh, when I was a little kid. He got a job at Trinity Church on Wall Street in New York, um, which was super cool. Um, it was just an amazing experience to grow up in New York City and be a part of that part of New York City. And then um, he got his own church in Franklin, Tennessee, which was a culture shock for me. Uh, at 12 years old to go from New York City to Franklin, Tennessee, and all of a sudden I had a yard and people talked weird and they thought <laughs> I talked weird. Um, but I, I love Nashville because it's, it's Franklin is just a suburb of Nashville, basically. It's sort of like Cary uh, to Raleigh. Um, I love Nashville. I love New York. It's, it's a weird uh, <laughs> combo there. Uh, and then I went back to my roots, went to Florida for college, went to the University of Florida. Um, I'm a diehard Gator. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll see way too much Florida Gator stuff for North Carolina, North Carolinians tastes, but I don't apologize for that. Um, and I uh, got a degree in uh, telecommunications, technically. Everybody thinks that has to do with phones or something, but it was basically a broadcast journalism degree. Um, I, and I, I was talking to you guys about this beforehand. I fell into that completely by accident. Um, my roommate and I both needed some gen ed credits in English. And he said, well, why don't we take this writing for TV class? And I said, okay, that sounds good. And the next thing I knew, it was my major. I loved it. Um, and I got to do a lot of work on campus. We had a TV station on campus and a radio, like an NPR affiliate on campus. And so I was the 
all things considered host for the local uh, morning drive time uh, at age 19. It was it was super fun. Um, and then keep in mind, I grew up in New York City. I got my first job out of college in Ottumwa, Iowa and lived there for three years. Um, I'm probably one of the few people on the planet who's lived in both Ottumwa, Iowa and New York City. Uh, most people have never even heard of Ottumwa. Last time I checked, it, it was population 20,000. Um, and it's probably less than that now, unfortunately. It's, it's one of those rural areas that's really struggled. Um, I worked there as a, a reporter, weekend anchor, uh, sports anchor um, for a few years, and then sort of started moving up the ladder in TV. I worked in Savannah, Georgia uh, at WTOC there for a few years. Loved Savannah. It's an amazing place. And then uh, got up to Raleigh and worked at, at the time it was NBC 17. Now it's CBS 17. Um, and I was there for a few years. And after that was a decade into my first career, and I started sort of getting burnt out a little bit on the TV grind. Um, I loved, I got to do some of the coolest stuff in the world while I was a reporter, but it had turned into more of a job than a career. And uh, the amount of pressure of that type of job just didn't fit what I wanted to do anymore. So uh -huh. I was lucky enough to get a job uh, doing PR for a solar company here in the triangle called Southern Energy Management. And they're a great place. Uh, and I love the folks over there, but they started needing more of a salesperson than a communications person. And I did not want to do that. So um, I left them in good graces and we're still you know, friends with a bunch of folks over there, but that just wasn't what I needed to be doing. So then I ended up at the Nurses Association um, and I've been here for almost a decade and I love it and I've got no reason uh, to even think about going anywhere else for now. So here I am. This that is there's so much to dive into in terms of your exciting past. I want to hear all about the fun stories. And for our our listeners, if you haven't stalked Chris on LinkedIn or Twitter, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic and entertaining. So I know there's a lot of stories. Um, so well, we might go back to a little bit, but what brought you, what excited you about working with the North Carolina Nurses Association? So starting with, I've, I've been very lucky that I, you know, I went through lots of, um, lots of rounds of layoffs and things like that when I was in TV, but I managed to survive all of those. And I felt very lucky that I was able to be patient with where I wanted to go next. Because um, a lot of folks, I mean, we had days where you walk in and a third of the people that you worked with yesterday weren't there, but I managed to not be part of those cuts uh, every time. And I was able to be very intentional about where I went. And it was important to me to go somewhere where I could be proud of the good we were doing and I felt like going to a solar company, 100%. I've, I've always been a pretty, uh, I've, I've leaned pretty hard on, on um, being good for the environment and that sort of thing. I've been driving a, a, a plug-in hybrid for 12 years now um, and have you know, always sort, sort of thought that that side of things was important. And so working for a solar company was great. And then again, they didn't, have the role for me there wasn't exactly what I wanted to do in terms of my professional stuff, but I had a job for, you know, so I was able to, you know, look for a job while I had a job and it, it gave me enough, it gave me the opportunity to be patient. I saw the opening pop up for nurses and I thought, wow, that's a really good way to help people who are doing some good in the world. And um, I, I, obviously not a nurse. Uh, I don't have a ton of nurses in my family. I, I'm embarrassed at how little I knew about the profession when I first took this job in retrospect. Um, but it's been, it's been fantastic. And I'm super, super proud of the work we do here. I'm proud of the people I work for, um, especially after the last two and a half years. Um, it has afforded me one of the most 
fascinating perspectives uh, of a pandemic to work with and for nurses at a time like this. So I feel immensely lucky uh, to be able to do what I do. Yeah, share a little bit more of that. I was, as you were talking about your past experience, you used the word burnout. You went through that and now you're on, you're, you're, you're watching the front lines of, of colleagues who are probably experiencing the same. Tell us a little bit more about the challenges you saw your members, your constituents go through as through COVID-19 and now the nursing shortages. What are the challenges you're seeing there and how, how are you trying to support your nurses through it? It's, it's hard to see. We've done um, a handful of surveys of our own members over the last few years and reading through their responses has been heartbreaking at times. Um, they feel nurses have this innate need to help other people. It's just part of who they are. Um, and you could see that they felt like if they weren't giving it their all, they were letting folks down but at the same time, they were at the end of their ropes and they were being asked to do more. They're, you know, they'd work a bunch of shifts and go home and finally try to unplug and get a call saying, hey, we need somebody to cover another shift. Can you be there? And they, a lot of them just felt obligated to put themselves you know, in second place again and, and go be there for patients. And you can only do that for so long before it, it just completely wears you out. And we're seeing so many nurses um, either leave the profession or leave the bedside and go into other roles and things like that, which then just adds to the stress of those remaining. And it's this vicious cycle right now. We were already facing a, a nursing shortage before the pandemic. It's something that NCNA had been trying to ring the alarm bell about before any of this happened and that's just exacerbated it so the next 10 years are going to be rough um on the profession there's the the north carolina board of nursing and the chef center at unc put together this great tool uh last year called the nurse cast and you can plug in all sorts of hypotheticals and say okay if we graduate x more nurses than we are now how will that help but none of the trends for any of those hypotheticals right now are headed in the right direction. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the next uh, decade is like, but right now it, it's going to be tough. I know. And um, that's amazing. I hadn't heard about that. So that's really helpful for our, our group to know about as you um, think in 10 years down the line, it, it, it seems it rough. Um, talk us through the next 12 months. There's, or even the next 12 weeks, there's a lot going on. Um, here in North Carolina right now would love your take on the priorities and the initiatives for uh, the North Carolina Nurses Association right now over the next few days, weeks, months, given the legislature. Well, I feel like the timing of me being on today could not be better just because of all of the, the news going on right now. If this had been a week and a half ago, there would have been a lot of hypotheticals about what might happen. In the span of eight days, we just went from zero to 60. Um, right before the short session started, everybody was talking about how they'd love to see Medicaid expansion. And the nurses have been pushing the SAVE Act for years, which would give uh, full practice authority to advanced practice registered nurses. And all sorts of other groups had these uh, priorities that they were hoping to see action on, but I don't know that anybody was super optimistic that we'd get a whole lot done this short session. Eight days later, a lot of that has passed the Senate. Um, it has just been a whirlwind. Um, so for those of you, I'm sure this audience is probably pretty much up on what's going on. But, yeah, but just give, a, case, give a quick primer. <laughs> yeah, so House Bill 149 was completely gutted and rewritten in the span of hours, it seems. Um, it includes Medicaid expansion, with the, which the Nurses Association is 100% in favor of. It includes the SAVE Act, the bill that we've been supporting with a ton of outside groups. Um, the, the diversity of organizations outside of the healthcare professions that support this is mind-blowing. Everybody from AARP to Blue Cross Blue Shield, the 
conservative think tanks to the March of Dimes to public health organizations and veterans associations and things like that um, all support full practice authority for advanced practice registered nurses. That got put in 149 in its entirety. Uh, things like certificate of need and surprise billing and a handful of other um, policies that other groups had been hoping for were all thrown into this one massive omnibus healthcare bill. And it passed three committees in the span of just a few days and went to the floor for a vote and passed yesterday uh, 44 to one. And so now it's gone to the house uh, who's not shown much appetite for this, but um, considering the players involved on the Senate side, you got to think that some serious conversations are going to happen no matter what the House is saying publicly right now. You just don't see folks like Senator Berger put himself out there this publicly very often unless he's got a plan for getting this thing through somehow. So it's going to be fascinating to see how everything rolls out over the next uh, few weeks, because they are talking about it being a very short, short session. Um, I mean, we could be done and legislators could be going home by the 4th of July. So it's going to be, it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, you, you didn't say this in, in your earlier part, but I, I know this from stalking you on LinkedIn. You have experience as a sports reporter and anchor. So uh, I, I appreciate, but love to, you know, have you have the microphone and do a play by play of what's happening right now in real time. And then, but also your ability to do some predictions. What do you, Ooh. to the extent we can, and we will hold you to this, no. Um, <laughs> What, what's your sense of what's going to happen, especially with the two that you if, if that you shared that the Nurses Association feels the most strongly about Medicaid expansion and the SAVE Act? What's your uh, predictions scorecard for that? I, I have no clue if it's going to happen in the short section or not. I do think something along these lines is going to pass, if not later this fall in some sort of special session. I, I could see it happening next year. I think the momentum for these types of policy changes nationwide is just too strong. Um, the, the pros outweigh the cons a thousand to one for some of these issues. And um, for like the, the two policy issues that NCNA has, has been most passionate about, they go hand in hand. Um, and I think there's a good reason why they put the SAVE Act in with Medicaid expansion, because you, you want to give coverage to 500,000 more people, you got to make sure that there's the healthcare professionals behind that change to give the care to the folks who all of a sudden haven't been doing anything other than going to the ER every time they've got a problem. If they all of a sudden have the ability to go get some of that uh, chronic care taken care of the way that they should, you got to have that access behind that. Otherwise, what are you even doing it for? Mm -hmm. Now, to the extent you can share these things on our on our broadcast, the the biggest opposition to the SAVE Act, is, as I see, is coming from uh, partners in the medical world, mm -hmm. um, uh, specifically some of the medical societies. Is there, I'm assuming, but to what you can share, some behind the scenes conversations going on between the, you know, I was seeing something about the nurse anesthet anesthetist versus the radiologist. And so are there a lot of behind the scenes working to try to get to some agreement among those in the medical profession? There has been over the years. Um, we have conversations with them and it's never really gone anywhere. Um, we try really hard not to make this doctors versus nurses. That's not how we see it. Um, that, that group of 20 organizations outside the nursing profession that also support this don't see it that way. Um, there's a lot of physicians who are fully in favor of this, but it's organized medicine that's really uh, been the, the only uh, opposition to this. There's no, you know, we've got 20 organizations that support this. They don't have any other organizations outside of uh, organized medicine that oppose it. Um, you know, we, we 
we understand um, why they say some of what they say, but the evidence uh, doesn't support their position. Um, the, the, it just doesn't. Um, there's been decades of research on the safety and efficacy of granting full practice authority to advanced practice nurses. The quality for when their scopes overlap has always been as good or sometimes in some cases even better. And we're sort of, we're not interested in a doctors versus nurse fight or anything like that um, because we don't see it that way at all. We just see it as a way of expanding access to quality healthcare to folks who need it the most. So. Sure. And in the articles, you know, especially in, in I, I've, I'm going to do a shout out to your website, especially in the interest of time, since we're going to have to wrap up soon. But if you go to ncnurses.org, you have a great section on uh, your legislative work and some great links to articles about it. So I know it helped me get um, uh, smarter about some of the issues or more knowledgeable. So so I'll do a shout out for your website. I know. Um, the question that I'm sure a number of our coalition members have, and, and I do invite coalition members who are on right now, feel free to do any questions in the chat. Um, but, you know, as we talk about bringing the medical professions together, the healthcare profession together, the North Carolina Serious Illness Coalition has over 170 members. We represent various aspects of the healthcare space, the social services space, the advocacy space throughout North Carolina. And so, how how can the coalition be helpful with the efforts that you're seeing either right now or over the next 10, I hope not daunting years of the North Carolina Nurses Association, but how can the coalition and the Nurses Association work more together? First and foremost, contact your representatives today. Do it as soon as we hang up here and tell them to support uh, concurring with 149. Um, we know it's gonna be a tough, hill in the house um and so the more organizations that can openly support medicaid expansion um the better um secondly and you know if for for those of you who are interested in supporting the save act i, I mentioned we've got 20 organizations it was 19 a week ago we just added uh friends of residents and long-term care they're our newest organization they just came on board on tuesday so we're actively looking for other organizations that support full practice authority for advanced practice registered nurses. It doesn't take much effort. Um, send us your logo, a quick statement about why you support it. And that's like the baseline amount of level and, and we're good, we're happy with that. Um, anything you can do from the grassroots level beyond that is just icing on the cake. But the more that we can grow this coalition and show, I mean, I've never seen such a weird coalition. I mean, having John Locke Foundation and Americans for Prosperity and March of Dimes and AARP all working on the same issue is just weird to me. And and I yeah. love it. It's great. It's a motley crew in a in a in a great sense. It is yeah. it is a, a nice diverse uh, yeah, supporters. Thank you, Virginia. She just posted the link to the North Carolina Nursing Association, or Nurses Association, so that way um, people can learn a lot more. And I do, as I said, uh, suggest people stalk you on uh, LinkedIn or join officially because there's a lot there. Um, before I ask any other questions, again, if anyone in the in the group has a question, I know um, there's a nice amount of nurses in our um, in our on this call now, but also on the coalition, and so there's been a lot of excitement to have um, you on. I'll I'll ask one of my uh, a question that that I've been thinking as as if others have. Um, so again, I'm totally struck by your broadcast journalism background. I think that's super cool, and. Um, we have had a, a we've had a written reporters on from the North Carolina Health News. You've been in front of the camera. Oh, I was going to go downstairs and get my kids microphone. If, if you had the microphone and you were handing it to us, what's the best way that coalition members or others can create those powerful, engaging stories that really get an audience excited? What's been your experience of how to like get newsworthy? <laughs> It really boils down, I mean, stats are great and they help bolster your argument, but it's gotta be the personal connection stories. No matter what your issue is, you need to find out how 
your organizations doing something that impacted their constituents in a positive way and then have them come back and talk about what that meant to them. Those are the types of things that really resonate, whether you're trying to talk to a legislator, whether you're talking to hospital administrators, you know, whoever it is, it's, it's the, they did this and here's what that really meant to me. If you can get that third party sort of verification that goes so much farther than all the research or, um, or statistics that just make people's eyes glaze over. Um, so it's really finding those, those aha moments. One of the things, let's dive, let's go from broadcast journalism to psychology in the last few minutes. There's interesting things about what motivates people and the news generally is on the front lines of that. Do you motivate people through fear or do you motivate them through um, the happiness and joy and the feel good? My favorite part of the news is the last part. You know, there's good news tonight, but I know generally, unfortunately, what motivates people is often the fear. And so in, in our last few moments, what, how do you, you have all of those stories at the Nurses Association. So especially with the nurse cast that you told us about, which is yeah. pretty daunting. How do you decide whether to promote action through getting people scared and shaking them that way or sharing the beauty of what can happen? We've, we've leaned pretty hard into the positive side of things. We, we don't very often try and go the, if it bleeds, it leads route. <laughs> You know, there, there are times when we come out hard and, and say, you guys, you know, like we were, we were heavily involved in the vaccination push uh, when vaccines first came out back in December of 2020, and they weren't really available yet. And we had that window to convince people, because even among nurses, there weren't a lot of people who wanted, who were comfortable getting vaccinated yet. And we went from something like 40% uh, of the nursing population to saying they would get vaccinated to 90 plus percent of the nursing population actually doing it in the span of six months, which is just mind blowing how big of a shift you saw there. Um, and we, you know, there were scary ways you could promote that. There were positive ways you could promote that. And we, we lean really hard into the positive ways to promote that. And what it, you know, we had this whole campaign of nurses talking about why it was important to them to get vaccinated. And we ended up posting 50 different testimonials about that over the span of a, just a few months with pictures of them getting vaccinated themselves. And it was a lot of work to pull those stories together, but it was, uh, it was absolutely worthwhile. And I think it helped move the needle a little bit. Well, I, I love that you did that. I love that you were bringing the positive, sharing the voices together. I'd love to see more of that. Um, if you, speaking of bringing together, there is a discussion on the chat. There was a question about them doing the list and it's been shared in the chat of all the different groups that have come together to support the SAVE Act. So um, thank you, Virginia, for posting that. So I know yeah. there's been an interest in, in seeing how we can all come together. I, I know in our, our last few minutes left, and I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a great, what's the opposite of, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. I'm like, if, if it brings joy, ahoy, let, no, I can't do it. But um, I would love to see, I'd love to see, that's the touchy-feely in me, if we can stir action by the possibilities as opposed to scaring people. But um well, any last, you're, you're the closing reporter. So, you know, uh, in your one minute left, what's the, uh, what's the big take home about you um, or the association that we should know about? Um, I don't know. I've had a wacky career and I, I feel lucky to be where I am um, and love being here. I think uh, there's a lot of organizations that are trying to do a lot of good right now. And it's, it's just a fun moment to, you know, I, I'm not a lobbyist, but I work closely with our lobbyists and it's, it's a fun moment right now, even though none of us knows what's about to happen to see the 180 from the, the folks who had been so adamantly against things like Medicaid just a couple of years ago and have them all in and pushing hard is just, it, it's going to be a wild ride and I can't wait to see what happens next. 
Yeah. Well, it has been so great to have you. I think our one of our last comments will come from our friend Sue Deaton, who's on. She she gave a she gave us a suggestion. If it feeds the heart, it leads the mind. Well, I'm so happy that we have all these hearts and minds together. Chris, I can't thank you enough for taking your Friday morning with us, especially in this sort of legislative roller coaster of a week. Please keep um, both to you and the rest of the coalition. Keep uh, keep fighting the good fights, loving the the right love, and <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, go out and do great things. Thank you, thank so, you so much for having me. I appreciate it.